Okay, um, for the last part of the class, um, we're going to be talking about some other techniques that you can use, um, but we're not going to go into them into much depth. Um, so they're not something we're going to be expecting you to code with or to program yourself. But because it is one of the important parts of data science, we want you to at least see it and understand because it certainly is a technique that other people are going to be using um, and something that you might run into. So um, in the course, we actually talked about um, pretty big uh, set of uh, prediction model methods. So in numeric prediction, we talked about simple regression, multiple regression. We talked about fancier kinds of regression, like penalized regression for just a second. Um, we had CART and random forest models, which can do both numeric prediction and uh, classification. But there are a whole bunch of other techniques um, that, um, like I said, we're not really going to have time to talk about um, things like logistic regression, um, neural network support vector machines, um, all of these techniques, which are actually pretty cool and they solve um, very particular kinds of problems very well. Um, and like I said, for a couple of them, we're just going to do kind of these quick um, big idea videos so that you can at least see them and maybe recognize them when you see them out in the wild. So the first one is the idea of clustering and um, clustering methods are how you um, try to take individuals and rather than trying to predict something about them, we instead try to think about which individuals go together or which variables go together. So this is actually um, a sort of interesting problem. So rather than trying to say um, can I predict how much a customer is going to spend? Can I instead predict the general category of being a good customer, either a um, long time customer or a customer who spends a lot of money on each purchase or a customer who might be interested in a particular kind of product or maybe you have a new product and you're trying to identify which customers might be interested in that new product or line or service. Or going the other direction, um, can we figure out which variables are actually saying the same thing? Um, we'll talk about in one of the other videos how this would allow us to uh, maybe eliminate those variables and not worry about them so much so that we can get to a smaller data set so that we can get to something um, that might be easier to understand. Um, in that Ames housing database, um, for instance, it had all those different uh, measures of quality and it turns out that most houses are either very nice or not so very nice. So if you knew the quality of the kitchen, that would be a good predictor of the quality of the bathroom or the quality of the exterior or whatever. And while there would be particular individual cases where you could imagine they've redone the kitchen but the bathroom is really cruddy, um, in most cases there are nice houses and less nice houses and they kind of go together. Um, so um, we're going to talk about sort of two different um, ideas of clustering and uh, this first one we're going to talk about um, starts with this idea of a dissimilarity matrix and a proximity matrix. So um, here's some fancy algebra about it, but the idea is um, a dissimilarity measure is how far away something is in a very broad sense. So uh, moving away from the algebra part, and again you can pause this or come back to this if you really want to understand it, um, we calculate the distance between two points and then a proximity matrix is a list of all of those things. So for instance, here are five points um, on a chart and using regular distance, you could get a ruler out and measure these. Um, you can see how far apart each item is from each other one. This particular example we made, and again, I'm using Dr. Thatcher's slides because he makes awesome slides, um, have three dots that are sort of close to each other, three other dots that are sort of close to each other, but the two clusters of dots are not particularly close to each other. So you can see one, two, and three are all relatively close. Four, five, and six are all relatively close, but one, two, and three is far from four, five, and six in both directions. Now this is a matrix and in this case and in most cases the distance from point one to point two is 1.1. So if we had a little ruler here we would measure that. And that's the same as the distance from two to one. Each point is zero away from itself, right? And again if you think of these not just as distances but of the idea of dissimilarity, one is exactly like one, which is one of those things math people say, but it's sort of goofy to say. Um, and again, just with our eye, we can see that these two clusters um, sort of naturally uh, fall together. So like I said, there's two different techniques we're going to use. This first uh, technique 
is called k-means, and it's a technique for figuring out um, how many clusters there are when you know how many clusters you want to have at the start. The other technique, which we'll talk about in the second cluster video, is about um, what you do in the case where you want it to kind of naturally fall out. So the k-means algorithm says, let's take our data set, and you can see we just put the dots on here, and I, we made them gray, so they're kind of not really sticking out. And let's say we decided we want to have two clusters. Of course, we know because we've looked at the data that the two clusters are sort of easy to see with our eye, but imagine they aren't. And more than that, imagine we have more than just an X and a Y. We have a zillion different characteristics of each one. Um, <clears throat> people who study matrix algebra would say it lives in a larger dimensional space. But what it does mean in practice is it's really hard to calculate the distance between the points when you're in more than two dimensions. Of course, you can, um, and of course, you use the same formula to do that. But if you think about all the different characteristics we have in that real estate database or um, the restaurant quality database, um, these idea of distances can be a lot fancier than just simple distances. So anyway, the way the k-means algorithm works is we start by picking the number of centers that we think we're going to have. So if we have this data set of six points and we decide we want to um, find two middles or two clusters, what we do is we first randomly pick two points. And those are the two points uh, that we picked and we just marked one with a plus sign and one with a cross to designate the two, I'm sorry, an X, an X and a plus to designate the two uh, cluster centers. Notice that they aren't very good. Um, so you can't immediately uh, find the clusters. Again, with random things, that's what happens, random stuff. So the idea is that we hope the algorithm will sort of naturally flow to identifying our two clusters in a more useful or more realistic term. And again, these six points are made in a very simple way, but you can imagine we're looking at your customer database, we're looking at the purchases someone's made. Um, imagine, um, think about a grocery store like Hy-Vee, um, all the customers come in and you want to put them into clusters based on the kinds of things they buy, how much money they spend overall, um, those sorts of characteristics. So anyway, to start with, we pick our two random centers. And what we do then is we assign each point based off of which center is closest to them. So in our case, point one and uh, three are closest to uh, point three down here. And the other four points are actually closer to this one. Now, again, that's sort of weird because those aren't really good cluster centers, but because of the way we randomly picked our uh, two centroids, we call these, um, we get that. And again, we're normally gonna be in a space too big to think about how the clusters fall. Then what we do is we calculate the average of all of our points. And again, in two space, it's pretty easy to do. You just add up all the X values, divide by three, four in this case, add up all the y values, divide by four. Here, we're gonna take uh, the two points and add them together. Now, what's maybe not so interesting to you is that um, two points, the midpoint of the two is the mean. And if you just draw a line segment and did all that stuff you learned in geometry class, you would find that. Here, the midpoint is a little bit different. Now, notice we use the plus and the x to mark those. So the center of the yellow cluster is now moved to here and the center of the blue cluster is moved to here. Then what we do is now that we've moved our cluster, we now reassign our points. So now this point right here, I think it was point two, we've now moved from the yellow cluster into the blue cluster because it's closer to the blue centroid than it was to the orange centroid, the yellow centroid. Okay, so we've now assigned the points to the closest center and we now repeat and we now we move to the mean of these three points and the mean of these three points. And what we would find is the groups don't change because we've now hit the centroid where the groups are sort of naturally in the clusters they have. Again, in this example, um, it's sort of very silly and simple, but if you imagined you had thousands of customers, you had hundreds of variables, and you're trying to figure out which customers go together, or we're thinking about um, some other kinds of data, maybe we're looking at health data. So you have your blood pressure, your weight, your, I don't know, various things we get from a blood sample. And we wanna to try to find people who go together in the same categories, maybe people who exercise or people who are healthy or less healthy. Using these k-means is an automated way of finding a certain number of middle points, k-means for k-groups, 
Um, and it literally is pretty easy uh, to do, right? We pick K centers at random, we assign our points, we find the group centroids that the new centers are, we assign the points again to the center, we keep doing this again and again. Now, sometimes the results of a cluster analysis like this will depend on what our um, initial starting point was. So typically when we do an analysis like this, we do it multiple times and then we choose the final group that minimizes these within group distances. So to go back to our chart, again, because of the way we drew it, it doesn't take too much math to say that, you know, one, two, and three, and four, five, and six give you these smallest uh, distances between the groups, these distances to center. And we can calculate those distances in our regular way that we do, the uh, root mean squared error, here we go. Um, and you just calculate the distance from each point to the middle for all of them. Now, because of the size of the data sets, you couldn't work out every possible case. In this case, you actually could. We could just calculate all the distances and see how it goes. But if you start with different starting points and you run this multiple times, um, you can pretty quickly and pretty easily um, make some naturally occurring uh, clusters. Again, k-means is used in a variety of different industries, a variety of different settings. Um, I mentioned sort of customer identification and some health concerns, um, whether people actually do it. How do you categorize a, you know, a medium nice day or a sunny winter day? And uh, you find these means um, doing that. Now, the other thing about uh, systems like this is because these come from the data themselves rather than you defining what characteristics you're looking for, um, it could be that you don't get the categories that you think of. If you did that with weather, maybe um, you don't decide what a cold winter or sunny day is, but you instead find some other characteristics that are hard to find. So um, we call this um, an unsupervised learning technique as opposed to the ones we did before where we started with kind of the right answer. We knew which ones were supposed to go in which category. Here it's much more naturally occurring. And so again, that kind of has a danger to it because you don't know what the answer is you're gonna find, but it makes it more powerful because you can apply it to situations where you don't know what the answer is gonna be. Um, so in the second cluster video, we'll talk about the hierarchical model and we'll talk about dinosaurs.